When I first started talking to Steve about Pixar, a little more than 10 years earlier, in late 1994, the company had burned through almost $50 million of his money with little to show for it. The value assigned to Pixar stockholders on its financial statements at that time was negative $50 million, not even worth a dollar. <laughs> negative $50 million. Now, Steve's investment in Pixar had made him one of the wealthiest individuals in the world. My tenure at Pixar lasted from my conversations with Steve, from my first conversations with Steve in 1994, until the sale to Disney in 2006. This opportunity was one of the great privileges of my life. Although much has been written about Pixar's legendary creative and production processes, my side of the story looks at Pixar from a different angle. It's about the strategic and business imperatives that enabled Pixar to flourish. It's easy to look at Pixar's film accomplishments and imagine that they emerged in a blaze of creative glory, that Pixar was created as a storytelling artistic utopia. This wasn't my experience of it. The making of Pixar was much more akin to a high-pressure grinding of tectonic plates pushing up new mountains. One of those plates carried the intense pressures of innovation, the drive for artistic and creative excellence in storytelling, and the invention of a new medium, computer animation, through which to express it. The other of those plates carried the real-world pressures of survival, raising money, selling movie tickets, increasing the pace of production. These two forces ground ceaselessly against each other, causing many quakes and aftershocks. This is the story of how the little company that made the world fall in love with toys, bugs, fish, monsters, cars, superheroes, chefs, robots, and emotions emerged from the forces at work beneath it. It's about the choices and the absurd bets and the risks that made it possible. It's about the tension between creative integrity and real-world necessities and how that tension shaped those involved with it. Steve Jobs, Pixar's creative, technical, and production teams, and me. It's a story about what it means to put the creative impulse first and why this is so very hard to do. That's an excerpt from the book that I'm going to talk to you about today, which I think is criminally undercovered. I actually had never heard about it before um, and ended up finding it on this deep dive I've been doing, we've been doing on Steve Jobs. And, you know, we're in the middle of looking at Steve, not only through his biographies, through things that he's written, but also through the lens of many people that collaborated with him closely. And we obviously can't do that without studying Pixar. And I think there's two stories of Pixar, which were just highlighted in that excerpt. There's the creative excellence uh, story, which I think is largely captured best in Ed Catmull's book, Creativity Inc. And then there's this story that I had actually never heard before. It's insightful. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's actually hard to believe that Pixar survived going through what's covered by Lawrence Levy here. But this is the story of actually what made Pixar a business success. Because obviously, even Pixar today, it's an incredibly successful company. It produces great films, but that is not enough. If it wants to continue to produce great films, it has to have a workable business. And so this episode is all about the fascinating backstory of what it was actually like to build Pixar's business. You know, so uh, where, what I wanted to start with this episode, we're going to go all over the place, but where I wanted to start with this episode is first with a recap of what Pixar's business looked like in 1994. So again, the quick setup for this is um, Steve Jobs, you know, acquired Pixar for $10 million from Lucasfilms, paid, paid $5 million to get the business, invested $5 million in the company. Well, by the time Lawrence Levy gets brought in, Pixar, Steve has burned $50 million of his own money on Pixar. He's covering literally payroll. He's meeting monthly with Ed Catmull to basically write checks to cover operational expenses. And, you know, at this point in the journey, Steve had been on a very rough ride. Pixar actually started, and this was incredible to learn, as a hardware and software bet. I think for Steve, it actually felt uh, safe to him because it felt like, okay, maybe this is a mini Apple or a mini Next focused on computer animation. Now, that's obviously a world away from the Pixar we know today. But this is all fascinating. And so it's just, it's, it's been a fast, it's a fascinating story at looking at where Pixar started and what it had to do to become the incredibly successful company that we know today. Um, and so let's start with the business that Lawrence Levy inherits when he decides to join Steve Jobs and basically take over as COO, CFO of Pixar um, because it's pretty bleak. The book begins by setting up the terrible state of Pixar's business when Lawrence Levy took over in 1994. Steve Jobs purchased a majority stake in Pixar for $10 million from Lucasfilms. Um, it, it, it spun it out of Lucasfilm in 1986, but the Pixar of the 1980s and early 1990s was very different than the Pixar we know today. It was initially much more hardware and software centric. Pixar released the Pixar Image Computer. I didn't even know this was a thing. About three months after Steve Jobs purchased the company, 
three months after he purchased it, they had this first new hardware computer bet that failed spectacularly. It ultimately sold less than 300 units, and Pixar decided to exit the hardware business shortly afterwards. So first big idea, first big invention that Pixar had, complete flop, which was, uh, and, and basically pivoted the company from being focused on hardware at all to being focused on storytelling and software. And we'll talk about that. Similarly, Pixar has always built RenderMan. You know, if you go to pixar.com today, you can still see they sell RenderMan. They have a massive community. It's used in special effects all throughout Hollywood. Um, so it has always built RenderMan. It's rendering software internally. It sold that software to external customers when Lawrence Levy took over. But after a review with the business, he decided to lay off the sales team and stop selling RenderMan. So again, at this point in time, Lawrence Levy's coming in. He's starting to basically poke around. And they have there's three business areas. There's a RenderMan, which is doing almost nothing in terms of actual sales for the cost that it takes to develop the software. Uh, they're, they're doing basically shorts and commercials. So they're acting as kind of like a little mini agency. And then they're doing this feature film, which is a big crazy bet with John Lasseter, where John Lasseter is uh, directing a feature film, which he's never done before. And uh, Pixar is making a feature film, which they have never done before, uh, which is just incredible. And so, okay, Render Man, Lawrence Levy takes a look and just says, this does not make sense as business. This feels like a distraction lays off the sales team and stops selling RenderMan. Pixar's animation films, a byproduct of its technology and team, ended up being incredibly valuable. Pixar was eventually acquired for $7.4 billion by Disney, but it took 16 years. I mean, an incredibly long period of time from Pixar's founding in 1979 to the release of Toy Story. This is 16 years to the release of their first feature film. That's an, it, just staggering to think about that. And that, you know, so it took 16 years for it to not only release Toy Story, but to enjoy its first real taste of financial success. Because before that, they were struggling for survival for literally 16 straight years. Here's what Lawrence Levy discovered when he arrived, when he arrived at Pixar. When I first started talking to Steve about Pixar a little more than 10 years earlier in late 1994, the company had burned through almost $50 million of its own money. The value assigned to Pixar stockholders on its financial statements at the time was negative 50 million. Now Steve's investment in Pixar had made him one of the wealthiest individuals in the world. So again, start when Lawrence Levy joins, Pixar has negative 50 million on the balance sheet, meaning uh, the company's made nothing and Steve Jobs has covered and invested in the business $50 million. Uh, so just, you know, it's it, the reason I want to start with that is it was very eye-opening for me to learn about it, where Pixar really started. And I think the fact that it would not have survived, absolutely would not have survived if it didn't have somebody like Steve Jobs with both the means and the interest and the inclination to invest in Pixar. And, you know, there's been many, it's, it's been covered in many different ways why he made that investment. And, you know, he's, he's said many times before that the most talent dense team he's ever met in his life was the team at Pixar. And it's my belief that that's why he was investing in the company because they were exceptionally talented it was um, started out hardware, you know, turned to software and then feature films. And so, you know, I think it was a painful journey for Steve Jobs in those 16 years. But um, I think it was also just a, an incredible act of betting on talent and betting on that talent, being able to figure out how to create value from it. So that's, that's kind of where we start this story. Very bleak. Pixar's $50 million in a hole. They do commercials, which doesn't make a ton of money. They sell RenderMan software, which they stop doing, and they have this crazy bet on a feature film. Well, one of the things that's interesting, you know, um, a lot of the book, a lot of To Pixar and Beyond revolves around one central thing, and we look at it through two different angles, which is, um, you know, so Steve had been investing tons of money into Pixar, and I think at some point in time, what ends up happening is he realizes that I think part of the way to stem the bleeding is to effectively bet on John Lasseter's ability to make a feature film. But John's never directed a feature film. Pixar's never made a feature film. Pixar is already spending an enormous amount of money just to retain the talent that they have. And so what Steve ends up going and doing is signing an initial contract with Disney that basically Disney will fund Pixar's production expenses. Um, so, so they'll cover the costs of creating the movie 
But it ends up being an incredibly one-sided contract where on the flip side, Disney was set to earn 90% of the upside of any success. They had full creative control. Pixar had no ability to work on anything else that Disney wasn't funding or approving. Just brutal. And so a lot of the book revolves around this contract. Um, Try to give you a quick little bit of backstory here. Um, You know, while it gave Pixar its first real prospect of producing a future film and distributing it in movie theaters, the contract was heavily weighted in Disney's favor, which makes sense in hindsight because at the time the contract was signed, it was a risky bet on totally unproven technology. No one had ever made a computer animated film before, period. An approach to animation, which is the fact it's all digital, it's not done by hand. And a director in John Lasseter. John Lasseter had never made a feature film before. But signing this contract nearly sealed Pixar's fate as the terms were so egregious that Pixar's only chance of survival was if their first film was the most successful animated film of all time. Now, this is staggering. So, you know, the, let's go back to the story. Lawrence Levy comes in. He's investigating the business. It's looking very bleak. He finally ends up turning his attention to this feature film and John Lasseter and this team and is blown away by the work that they're doing and the story that they've developed and the characters that they've developed. He's blown away by everything. And so he goes and he says, okay, this is really promising, but you know, okay, this is going to be governed by this contract with Disney. Let's look at this contract. And the contract is just, it's airtight, number one. Uh, there's no wiggle room. There's no real, real way to get out of the contract or to, to find, find any loopholes, to be super frank. Um, and so literally one of the things he finds out is Pixar's only chance for survival isn't just that it makes the film and releases it, which was already a really um, difficult to believe big bet but that ends up being one of the most successful films of all time. And, you know, there's a point in the book where Steve and Lawrence are are kind of riffing on what they think Pixar might be able to do. And they think it'll probably, you know, come in around 50 to 75 million is, is they think it would be wildly successful. Toy Story ends up earning nearly $200 million. And so I think it's also just, you know, another thing that was interesting to me in this film is, um, for Pixar to release its first animated film, it had to sign a brutal contract that almost sealed its fate and killed the company. Its only way of succeeding was having a film that was so successful that it was able, its 10% share of the profits was enough that it could kind of survive, at least after that film for a little bit of time. And it ends up making that, you know, against all odds and being an absolute smash hit. It's just incredible. And it just goes to show you the number of things that had to happen I think for Pixar to really be able to reach escape velocity. Um, in the book, Lawrence Levy shares his take on why Steve Jobs signed the original contract with Disney. It's an interesting perspective. I reasoned that around 1991, Steve was ready to let go of Pixar. He had never set out to build an animation company. In 1986, when he took control of Pixar, Steve dreamed of building a technology company, a graphics powerhouse that would stun the world with machines that could do computer imagery like no other. Storytelling was an afterthought, a way to demonstrate the technology. The hopes of that graphics company had rested in part on the Pixar image computer, which had failed. By 1991, that division of Pixar had been shut down completely. At that moment, I concluded Steve was ready to give up on Pixar. Now, you know, again, this is like six months or a year into owning Pixar, which is just incredible that, you know, he ends up funding it for a long period of time after that. Um Nearly 10 years, you know, Toy Story was released in, I think, 1995? Yeah, 1995. So it ends up being almost 10 years. And so, you know, he's ready to give up on Pixar, say, one year into a 10-year journey that it took to actually produce Toy Story and get it out um, in theaters. He must have wanted out. The burden was simply too great and the dream dashed. He was in a very tough spot, however. It was five years since his departure from Apple, and he had not had a hit since. If he couldn't chalk Pixar up as a win, he badly wanted to avoid another highly public loss. That was the instant when the Disney opportunity came along. To Steve, the deal with Disney was a way to stop the financial bleeding. Steve's guard was down, and in that negotiation with Disney, he had been bested by Jeffrey Katzenberg, chairman of Walt Disney Studios, who handled the deal on behalf of Disney. Steve had signed up for terms, the implications of which he either didn't fully understand or to which he had simply yielded in order to get the deal done. This is fascinating. You know, it's a point of weakness for Steve is basically Lawrence uh, Lawrence Levy's insight here. You know, fascinating detail. Steve ends up negotiating this contract with Jeffrey Katzenberg. Well, a couple of years later, Jeffrey Katzenberg ends up having a disagreement with Disney, leaves to go found DreamWorks Entertainment that ends up being a major competitor in animation. And so it's, you know, fascinating to see the characters evolve and the roles that they play in the story. Um, and it's, you know, a fascinating perspective on, in many ways, 
you know, it sounds like Lawrence's take is Steve's journey was Pixar seems like a slam dunk investment for me because it's a hardware and software company. Uh, hardware ends up failing spectacularly. Software ends up being not financially lucrative enough. The storytelling, which is just meant to be basically the end output, like an idea of what, you know, it, the it's taking the tools that Pixar had created and it's really taking an output. To, and it was initially the, the stories were done to drive adoption and interest in hardware and software. And, you know, by the time 10 years later, after Steve acquired it and Toy Story's out, Pixar shifts completely. And its sole focus is on making feature films and characters that can be loved and appreciated uh, and stories that can be loved and appreciated for generations. And that ends up being Pixar's success. It's such a departure from where it started. Okay. So that's a little bit about this initial contract. We'll come back to this. One of the stories later in the book is the renegotiation of this contract after Disney's success and how defining that was. But one of the like asides that I enjoyed about this book is it's, um, you know, Lawrence is, he does a great job of describing, basically putting you in his shoes. And so he's never worked at an entertainment company before. He comes to Pixar, needs to help the company figure out how to make a successful company. Well, he effectively has to learn what an entertainment company is and how the entertainment business actually works. And I'll try to keep this section relatively short, um, but I think it's interesting and there's a bunch of insights that I appreciated. Um, so one of the fascinating elements of Pixar's story is that the company didn't originally set out to make blockbuster feature films. It was created to develop the software needed to bring computer animation to life. And it ran a small animation studio that mostly did commercials and small one-off projects. Pixar had to learn what building an entertainment company meant. To do this, Lawrence and Steve studied the entertainment industry, um, the business of film distribution. That's fascinating. I, I've got, I just ordered a, um, it was an incredible book I found, although it's very dense, um, which is Hal Vogel's, um, I think it's like, uh, he's, he's, an, he's a stock analyst. He studied the media and entertainment industry. He has a book all about the economics of everything entertainment, from theme parks to movies to uh, casinos. So at some point after I make my way through this uh, very um, intimidating book, <laughs> I will write a book summary. But for right now, it's just interesting. So that's one of the resources he has. It, it, there's a lot of conversations in the book. Um, but you know, Lawrence and Steve need to study the entertainment industry. They need to study film distribution. They need to figure out the economics. And you know, one of the parallels here that I thought was interesting is Disney's history and the parallels with Pixar. And that the the, um, the similarities are staggering. Here's just a few. So Walt Disney had long had an interest in newspaper cartoons, and after returning from service as an ambulance driver in France in World War I, he encountered animated cartoons for the first time and quickly fell in love with the field. Ironically, he feared that he had entered the field too late. Absolutely not true. And that there was no growth opportunity left in it, he ended up creating that opportunity by pushing the field into new territory, both creatively and technologically, just as Pixar was doing now. So I'll go to this in a second, give you a couple of other examples. But one thing that this book in studying Pixar in, in parallel with, with Disney drove home is that the origin story of Disney is incredible. It's much uh, more interesting than I thought it was. And the origin story is really Walt Disney as a technology pioneer. He's a pioneer of animation. He's a pioneer of color. He's a, he's a pioneer of different technologies and syncing sound with movies. And in many ways, you can see Pixar as that, where, and Steve has described it this way, that Pixar was really the next big leap in terms of animation that happened 50 years after Walt Disney created the Disney company. Um, and, it, you know, it's just, it's interesting to think about. And so it makes me want to study Walt Disney much more. I'm sure I will, and I'll cover it, and, and we can learn about it soon. Okay, other similarities. In 1928, Disney released a short black and white cartoon that changed the course of animation. Called Steamboat Willie, it ushered in breakthroughs on two fronts. It introduced the world to the most fully formed cartoon personality audiences had ever seen, Mickey Mouse. It was also the first cartoon to use synchronized sound, meaning that the sounds were timed to the action. Now, this is incredible, but this uh, Steamboat Willie is the first movie ever to have synchronized sound. Um, so sound was timed to the action, making the overall audience experience far more immersive than ever before. After the success of Mickey Mouse, Disney set his sights on the first animated feature film. It took him until 1937, so it took him nine years after releasing Steamboat Willie um, to release Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, a virtuoso accomplishment that ushered in many more breakthroughs in story, character, color, sound, and the way animation displayed depth. The film also introduced the world to the Seven Dwarfs and quickly sealed their place as icons of American culture. 
So you can start to see in the early years of, of uh, Disney, these, the creation of characters that will have a lot of resonance for a long time to come. Other parallels between Disney and Pixar were less inspiring. Like Pixar, Disney had struggled financially for years while Disney had bet it all on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, including mortgaging his house and taking out a risky bank loan. The success of the film paid off financially, but it wasn't long before Disney was struggling once again. Animation was proving to be a very fickle business and soon Disney was diversifying. So this is interesting. Put yourself in Lawrence Levy's shoes. You come to the company, you, you start studying the business, you realize, you know, crap, there's effectively one thing that's working that we're going to have to bet the whole company on and it's animated content. And then you go to study the best companies and Disney is one of the best companies, obviously at animated uh, content. And you just learn that it's a brutal business. And so, you know, I feel like a lot of the book was just Lawrence really learning, I think, the 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 depth of the problem that they were going to have, really creating a powerful business. And that's, that's why I think the book is so fascinating, is obviously for Pixar to ever reach its potential, it had to figure out the business side of the equation. And I think it's a really underappreciated fact. That's why I appreciate the story. Um, okay. Uh, let me see here. So, you know, so some of the takeaways, so, the, you know, what's interesting here is, so then he goes and does a bunch of, of, uh, of research in, so this, you know, he looked at Disney specific parallels, then he zooms out and just say, well, how does an entertainment company work? How do entertainment companies work? And what does that look like? He ends up having a bunch of conversations. Well, here's, this was interesting. Just a couple of tidbits of, of how entertainment companies work. Um, one of the pieces that was interesting is just, you know, that the, really the right way to think about an entertainment company is it's a portfolio business. Each year, studios earmark funds for a slate of films using three general budget. Here's our low budget films. Here's our medium budget films. And here's our big budget films. And then they do the same with marketing saying, okay, well, this low budget film is actually going to get a big marketing budget, vice versa. And they allocate amounts to market each film. Then they cross their fingers, literally release their slate of films for the year. And the, the hope, and this is why it's a portfolio business. You can also call it a, a fat tails business where then they just hope that the hits make enough money to outweigh the films that don't perform. And, you know, it's a fascinating encapsulation. I think it's also very humbling at just how difficult that is to do that reliably and to do that as a true workable business financially and operationally over long periods of time. So we've seen so many companies, uh, you know, come and go and struggle with various degrees um, in the entertainment business. Filmmaking's also not a great business because it's hard to succeed by releasing new films and the value actually often comes once you've built up a library. This is one of the reasons that, you know, the entertainment companies that have lasted have been very durable because they have very vast libraries. They have very vast back catalogs. And, you know, you can almost think of that as like you have a revenue stream with basically zero current cost. And so it gets, you know, and maybe another way of describing it is in the early years. So put yourself in Pixar shoes. You're about to release your first film. It's a terrible setup. You have no back catalog. Every, every dollar that you invest is going into something that will be a highly asymmetric bet that you just hope will work. And, uh, you know, you don't have multiple revenue streams. You don't have this sort of income um, to be able to, to tide you over and reduce some of the volatility. Once a film has enjoyed its theatrical run, both here and abroad, it becomes part of a studio's, studio's film library. If it's a good film, it stands to be watched again and again over the years. New technology like home video um, make that even more likely. The major studios have built up enormous film libraries that continue to provide value to their film business. And, you know, this is interesting. The big studios are really about providing two things. They provide capital and they provide distribution. So they effectively fund, you know, I, I guess you can think of it like they fund the creation of a product and that product is a movie or a television show. And then they uh, basically figure out distribution. They figure out the right way to market it and distribute it so that they can capture, you know, the, uh, as much value from what they've created as possible. One of the other th things that I thought was interesting is some of the specific implications uh, of, you know, so if you look at a Hollywood studio and you look at that model of basically hiring actors and directors and entire production crew and making a film, if you compare that to Pixar, one of the other things, and this is like, you know, I can just feel like a Lawrence Levy's emotional states ratcheting lower and lower and lower. One of the other things he finds out is actually since Pixar has a full-time staff of animators, they have an additional problem. And that additional problem is carrying costs. And I thought this was just interesting. There was also another issue that was unique to animation, a pesky detail that went under the title of carrying costs, which are the costs of paying employees when they're not working on films. When animation finished on Toy Story, for example, Pixar still had to pay its animators, even if it had nothing for them to do. 
It was a problem that had dated all the way back to the time Walt did of Walt Disney and one of the reasons it was so difficult to go into animation. This problem did not exist in live action film because the crew making the film, from the producer and director to the film stars to the cameramen, extras, and everyone else, comes together for the sole purpose of making a film. They are paid only during the time they are involved. And as soon as that ends, they all disperse and there is no further obligation to pay them. So effectively think of this as like, if you think about a, uh, a traditional Hollywood film, a live action film, it's freelancers, contractors, you get them on, they do a job and it dissolves and you have no cost. So, so literally uh, the investment is bound to, to tasks related to the creation of that film. And afterwards you have no obligation. Well, it's completely different when you have a full-time staff, when you have animators, your job, and it's it, 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 this responsibility falls solely on you, your job is that you have to make sure that you have these assets, which are also costs. You have to make sure that there's always output, that there's always, there's always always they are always driving revenue in some shape or form so that you don't just start eating massive amounts of costs. And this gets really tricky. Um, animation studios don't work that way. So Lawrence's conclusion, the cost of continuing to pay studio employees when the studio is not in the heat of producing a film could grow enormous. If Pixar didn't have well-planned solutions to keeping its people productive between films, even if a hit film, even if it, if it made a hit film, it could be drained of its profits by the overall carrying costs. Just crazy. Crazy. Okay. So now we get into, so this is kind of like, you know, we've, we've, uh, We've analyzed the business and we're now in a pretty uh, deep, dark place in terms of the realities that Pixar now faces. So, you know, from here forward, it's going to get interesting because what we're going to talk about next is uh, Lawrence Levy and, and Steve Jobs really defining these these four pillar business strategy, um, all of which they end up accomplishing fantastically. And then the renegotiation of this contract, which is interesting. And so we'll focus on that for the rest of the time. Okay, here, here's the backstory. In 1995, just as the team working on Toy Story was in their final sprint towards the film's release date of November 22nd, Lawrence Levy and Steve Jobs finalized the four pillars of Pixar's business strategy. So this is how they were going to succeed. This was the only way they were going to succeed. They basically sat down and said, what is our strategy moving forward? This is actually what Steve brought Lawrence Levy on to do. Figure out the business strategy. This is what they landed on. Number one. Just quadruple Pixar's share of the profits from their films. So if they're getting 10%, they at least need to get 50% is really what their, their end goal was, to get a 50-50 share. No way that's going to happen until they renegotiate the contract with Disney. That's okay. That's, that's what they have to do to accomplish it. So number one in, their, in, in this four-pillar business strategy is they just have to quadruple Pixar's share of profits from their films. Just one thing. Okay, number two. They need to do an IPO to raise at least $75 million. And the reason for that was... Um, part of the reason they had such a terrible contract with Disney is because Disney was paying all the production costs. And so, you know, if you're Lawrence Levy and you're Steve Jobs, you say, okay, we've got this film. We hope it's going to be successful. Even if it's the most successful film, that, even if it's one of the most successful films that's ever been released, we're going to get a paltry amount. And, you know, and so Lawrence does this analysis and basically says, let's say it makes $100 million. Well, our 10% share gives us 10%. Well, the issue at Pixar is at the time, it takes them four or five years to make a new film. So they get $10 million from this last film that has to tide them over for four more years. And then that next film better be just as successful because if it's not and they have a flop, they go four or five more years, just a really depressing setup. So the second one is they need to raise $75 million through an IPO so that they can pay for the production costs on their film. And also just frankly, de-risk the business. That's two, just 75 and just an IPO for an animation studio that hadn't released a film <laughs> at this point. Number three, they have to uh, move from releasing one film every four years towards releasing a film each year. So they have to, uh, they have to basically 4X the amount of films that they're like, they have to improve, they have to improve dramatically the pace at which they're releasing films. So instead of the, instead of releasing one every four years, it's one every year. I mean, just remarkable. So each of these, you're like, wow, that's each of these on its own sounds incredibly difficult. And again, we're only three out of four. So that's a third bullet point. And then the fourth is, um, and I love this, and this resonates as being very true for who Steve is, which is and a thought from day one was Pixar has to be a worldwide brand. And that a lot of the equity and the value that Pixar would build would be in the brand. And this makes sense. I think it's actually a fantastic lens to think about Steve Jobs. Is if you think about all the companies he founded and was a part of, 
Apple, next, Pixar. A core part of the strategy was to have an incredible brand. And it didn't mean, you know, it didn't, I'm not saying a beautiful logo. I'm saying literally value in the name and value accruing to the company and people appreciating and recognizing and going to that company for things. And so he applies this strategy to Pixar and says, you know, the only way that we're going to do this is we have to build a worldwide brand. So, okay, so those are the four. They had to start by moving Pixar's share of films from 10% uh, to 50%. This uh, necessitated negotiating their three film contract with Disney. So again, it's all this crazy thing. You know, they're still having even produced their first film. And this initial contract is meant to span three films and Disney does not need to renegotiate it unless Pixar has leverage, can get them to the table, can get them to negotiate it. They had to raise at least $75 million. So that would help them renegotiate their contract with Disney because then they could say, hey, you know, we want to renegotiate. Part of the renegotiation is you no longer have to cover our production costs. We're going to cover those. And so if we're covering those, we now want to re renegotiate the profit share at the end. Um, but, but those two things wouldn't be enough. They also had to increase the frequency with which Pixar released films. The issue with making one film every four or five years was that if they had a flop, it would take another four or five years. And so it wasn't just the risk of any individual film. It was the risk of surviving the period in between films, which is, I think, just really interesting to think about. And so what that meant is, you know, they would potentially have to wait eight to 10 years between hits um, if they didn't have a hit on one film. And then all the pressure went on the next film, just way too big of a risk. And finally, Pixar couldn't build a thriving company without a thriving brand. But under their agreement with Disney, all of their films, including Pixar, I thought this was incredible. So, you know, the original Toy Story, I don't remember the release of this film, but the original Toy Story didn't even have Pixar's name attached to it. It said literally on all the movie posters and at the beginning of the film, it just said Disney Animation Presents. Pixar was left off completely. So they had no branding associated with the film. And, you know, what they're really looking for here is they want to get co-branding. So what they want to try to achieve at this point in time, again, their name's not even mentioned on anything. So that's the first to have their name mentioned, but then they want to go to Disney and say, we want 50-50 placement, which means it shows up, you know, if you go and look at any Pixar product today or any movie poster, you see Disney and Pixar, the logos locked up side by side, but they're also optically equally weighted. So it's not that there's a massive Disney logo and Pixar's tiny, it's that Pixar needs equal billing. Um, now, here's what's incredible. You know, reading through that list, um, it feels impossible to accomplish all of those. It feels impossible, honestly, to accomplish two out of the four. Well, if we fast forward two years, they end up accomplishing all of these. On November 30th, 1995, Pixar went public under the ticker symbol PIXR. They raised $140 million, so not just $75 million. On, no, on February 25th, 1997, Pixar closed and announced their new 10-year, five-film deal with Disney that gave them 50-50 profit share and equal branding with one renegotiated contract. Obviously, Toy Story had a lot to do with that, as did the money that they raised and the fact that they could fund production. And then in 1998, Pixar released their second film. So this is three years after Toy Story, followed by Toy Story 2 in 1999. So you start to see, okay, they released one film. It took them, I think, six years from the time they started working on, on uh, the initial Toy Story movie. They then are able to get two films, A Bug's Life and Toy Story 2, out within four years, which is pretty exceptional. So which doubles Pixar's initial pace of one movie every four or five years. It's still not one movie a year, which is roughly, it feels like what Pixar is at today, but it's better. It's much better. Okay, so I thought it was just interesting. It was interesting for me to, to all of that makes sense. And I think it's a great, what I appreciated about it was it's such a fantastic distillation of starting with this really challenging picture, being able to say, you know what, there is a way out of this. But here's the way. And we have to accomplish all of these very difficult things. Um, but it's very clarifying. And obviously, they were able to do it. And I think it all starts with having conviction and clarity around what your strategy is. So, you know, the, the next piece of this is really renegotiating Pixar's contract with Disney. And the reason I want to zoom in on that is, okay, we kind of have this meta-level perspective of what the strategy was, this four-pillar business strategy. That's great. There was many parts of that that were difficult. And the book does a fantastic job of telling the backstory of going public. And just that alone was, I mean, when you hear about it, uh, they got turned down by all major investment banks. They had to find two obscure banks and put them together. They just, all of the hoops they had to uh, jump through, even just to take Pixar public was staggering. 
And it's fascinating, but I don't know how applicable that is. But what I, you know, I don't know how broadly applicable, meaning I don't know how if spending more time on that, I'm not actually sure what of that correlates. And I would say almost nothing. But something to me that resonated really deeply and I think correlates and is something all of us can appreciate is negotiation. And literally, you know, going back to what I said before, if there's one, you know, if there, if uh, the, the story of Pixar's creation as a business had one evil character, it was this initial contract with Disney. Um, and so what I thought was fascinating is, again, part of the strategy was they literally had to renegotiate. And they had two options. They could either wait till the end of this three-year deal, which they thought would take at least 10 years. I mean, and they would be living in terrible economic uh, condition and no co-branding, just literally basically unworkable for them, especially after the success of Toy Story to, to go and honor the remainder of this contract. But again, Disney did not need to renegotiate. And so Pixar had to come up with the leverage and be in a position to be able to, to um, get the terms that they wanted. But I think it's fascinating. So um, anyways, so, so I'll dive in and share a little bit about the, how they renegotiated, because I think there's some really powerful lessons we can learn. And, you know, the most valuable part of this book for me was literally two, cut, two chapters that covered the renegotiation of this contract, which is titled Anatomy of a Deal and Poker Time. And the reason I appreciated it is, again, going back to we're doing this deep dive on Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is known as an incredible negotiator and deal maker, you know, from releasing the original iPhone and negotiating an exclusive contract with AT&T to do that. Uh, no way the iPhone would have been able, you know, it was akin to basically um, Pixar saying, we've never made a feature film. We need to partner with someone to get this out. Apple had to do the same thing. They ended up being able to negotiate a deal with AT&T to get iPhone out to the world. Um, and then they were in a position of strength. One example. Second example is even Pixar's initial contract. I mean, being frank, it's a terrible contract when you look at the details, but it's a great contract in the sense that they got Disney, the leading animation studio in the world, to fund their production, given that the studio, you know, the technology was unproven, Pixar was unproven, um, their style of animation was unproven, and John Lasseter was unproven. Like that, that is incredible still to get a deal done. And, you know, finally, to, to get Pixar acquired by Disney at the end of the day for $7.4 billion. And so, to, again, to sum it up, the beginning of the story starts with Pixar being $50 million in the hole. It is worth negative $50 million because that's all Steve has invested in it. And by the time the story ends, Pixar is acquired by Disney. And that's when Steve just starts to come back to Apple and, and has a massive resurgence at the company. It's worth $7.4 billion. And this is actually what makes Steve Jobs a billionaire first is being, uh, you know, owning the vast majority of Pixar at the time. Just, just absolutely incredible. So, you know, so those are the, my two favorite chapters. Well, I wanted to share kind of what I took away from those chapters. And there's really five things. And one, and we'll just start here because I think it's, um, one, it's uh, goes completely against conventional wisdom. Um, but I think it's also just like it goes to show why Steve was also a very successful negotiator. And it's, you know, so, so the, this kind of first idea or first principle is don't engage in positional bargaining. Dig in where you have extreme conviction and don't budge, which is what Steve did. To start, it helps to understand Steve Jobs' approach to negotiation, which was an all-out rejection of the standard approach. Now, when you or I typically enter a negotiation, we do positional bargaining. And this, you know, just reading this, honestly, it was the first time I ever thought about it. And it's damning. It's a, it's, it's a, damning, it's a damning takedown of why no one should do that. Okay, here's an excerpt from the book. The natural tendency in negotiations is to engage in positional bargaining. This means taking a position knowing that it is not your final position and holding in reserve a backup position. The danger of positional bargaining is that it forces you to think about backup positions, which weakens your conviction in your original position. It's like negotiating against yourself. Plan A may be your optimal outcome, but inwardly you've already said, hey, I'm, I'm just sharing that to basically enter negotiation. And what I actually want is, is this thing back here called plan B. Both Steve and I had a strong distaste for approaching negotiation this way. We preferred to develop our positions without thinking through a backup. Once Steve decided what he wanted in a negotiation, he developed something akin to a religious conviction about it. In his mind, if he didn't get what he wanted, nothing else would take its place and so he'd walk away. This made Steve an incredibly strong negotiator. He would dig into his positions with fierce, almost unbreakable grip. The risk was in so overreaching that we would end up with nothing. So again, you know, and, and I think this is why everyone defaults to positional bargaining 
is you actually typically start from an overreach and then you say, well, hey, there's this, you know, um, there's this thing I'd be comfortable with that that is my where, kind of where I would actually walk away if we don't honor that. And and so this, you know, basically the risk of not doing positional bargaining is you can't overreach. Um, you know, you you, ha you can't you basically you can't have a backup plan, so you need to be very thoughtful about where you're going to dig in and not budge. And so what I appreciate about this was know what you want and what your non-negotiable items are. Keep them small. Keep them to just a few things, and then don't bargain with yourself and hold on to those things with an unbreakable grip. I think that's, you know, it's it's. I think it's incredibly insightful, and I think it's also um, for me, it's a, it's a huge aha in terms of why Steve was effective and why that style of negotiation does not work very well. Number two, understand the difference between strategy and tactics when negotiating. Now, this was really interesting. It's just a breakdown of, of how they separated these out. Here's an excerpt from the book. In business relationships or virtually any relationship for that matter, there are two factors that um, determine one's capacity to affect change. Your negotiation and the tactics you employ. Leverage, uh, or sorry, sorry, leverage, and so, so two things, uh, sorry. Leverage, which is your bargaining power, and tactics in terms of tactics of how you negotiate. Leverage means bargaining power. It's the muscle you have to bring about change in your favor. The more leverage, the better your chances to get what you want. In poker, leverage would be the equivalent of the actual strength of your hand. Negotiation uh, or tactics, you know, but, you know, negotiation is, is kind of the term that they use, is the style with which you negotiate. It's the tactics you employ to extract the best terms. So again, you have leverage, which is, hey, here's the, here's the hardened position. Here's the benefits, the pros and cons, the positions of strength that I'm coming from that's really giving me the power in this negotiation. And then separately, there's tactics. And, you know, what was interesting, I guess my take here is um, separate the two, separating the two is very insightful. I think tactically, my idea is that we should all show up like ourselves. But, you know, separating these two, I think, gives you the power to take some liberty when it comes to tactics because they're just tactics and they might work negotiating with some parties and, and not with others. Okay, so what do those look like? Well, it's about how you play your hand. You know, tactics can be courage, fear, tenacity, trustworthiness, creativity, calm, the willingness to walk away, to behave irrationally. These all play into negotiation. So you can have a poor position of leverage, but be act like a crazy person and <laughs> strike fear into your opponent and, you know, always be irrational and be willing to walk away. You know, that's, that's one approach or you can have a great hand and you could decide not to do any of those things. And you're going to be trustworthy and calm and you're going to have tenacity in terms of how you negotiate. Leverage is an assessment of bargaining power. You know, negotiation is how you put that bargaining strength to work for you. A good negotiator can make more out of the same leverage than a not so good one. In Pixar's first agreement with Disney, Pixar had fared poorly in terms of both leverage and negotiation. Pixar had not had much leverage because it had just closed down its hardware business and was struggling to remain afloat, had never even made a feature film. In terms of negotiation, I felt Steve had been caught in a rare, weak moment. This was more than four years ago, though. Steve liked to cite the adage, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. What had occurred four years earlier was not going to happen again. So again, that's the second point. And, and really, it's just when you think about negotiating, separate out your leverage, which is your bargaining power, the strength of your true hand, and tactics. And be open as you go into a negotiation to think freshly about what tactics you want you might want to employ and i think one that like cognitive let's separate the two and then let's really analyze and we'll talk about this more in a second let's really analyze the leverage and be really clear-eyed about it but let's also be thoughtful and potentially creative about the tactics we use and let's you know make that fit to who we're negotiating the position we're negotiating from all of it i think it's very insightful Okay, number three, analyze where you stand in relation to the other party. And this is, I think, seeing your leverage or your bargaining power clearly. Here's how Steve and Lawrence Levy did this. One Friday in late 1996, when Steve was at Pixar, we stepped into the small windowless conference room near my office to discuss where we thought Pixar stood in relation to Disney. As we often did, we wrote down the main points of discussion on a whiteboard. There was one in front of the room with a wooden casing around it. We had discussed all of these points before, but it was helpful to see them in one place. Steve took a whiteboard pen and made two columns, Disney and Pixar. Under the Disney column, he would write the points that gave Disney leverage, and under the Pixar column, he would write the points that favored Pixar. The column-by-column -column breakdown ended up looking um, a, a little bit like this, and it was you know, difficult to, dis to 
discuss or difficult to to assess how this would play out. Um, and so let me just really quickly, apologies, I have to pull up a quick uh, graphic of what this looks like. Give me one second. Okay, so here's the breakdown of columns. And this is where they end up concluding. In the Disney column, basically the points of Disney's leverage is one, they didn't have to negotiate, just point blank, period. Number two, they could decide to invest in computer animation themselves. I mean, Disney had a, uh, you know, vibrant, wonderful animation business, one of the best in, in the world. Why couldn't they, you know, from Pixar's point of view, decide to invest in computer animation? Now, there's a lot of pitfalls if they decided to do that, but it's definitely a point, it's something to flag that, hey, an option for them is just saying, we're going to do it ourselves. Number three, you know, for, for Disney is that, um, you know, other options were potentially inferior. So they, they had this deal with Pixar and it was a great deal. And again, they didn't really need to negotiate, but you know, everything else was, was basically an inferior option. Um, another thing for Disney, Pixar only had one hit. So by the time they go to the table to renegotiate with Disney, Toy Story had come out and Toy Story was enormously successful. That honestly gave Pixar, between that and the IPO money to pay for productions, that gave Pixar all of their nego you know, negotiating power, their bargaining power. But the, you know, the fact remains, Pixar still is only one hit. It's only released one hit film. And the fifth is, you know, potentially... Uh, animation might be losing priority for Disney. Disney's a, uh, you know, it's a diversified business. They have many different things that they can focus on and invest in. And at any point in time, those businesses are doing to varying degrees well or not well. And so, you know, an honest fact is maybe animation wasn't going to be important enough. On Pixar's column, they had IPO money to pay for productions. Again, they now had $140 million. It's a lot of money that they raised from their IPO that they could now fund their own movies. They had Toy Story success. And again, so it wasn't just some success. This was literally one of the most successful films ever released. It ends up doing nearly $200 million. And I think Beauty and the Beast, which they were benchmarking it against, which I think was, was Disney's most recent, most successful animated film, did $80 million. And so Pixar, on their first film, does $200 million, just staggering. A third thing, and this is really interesting, it's again, look at the competitors, but for Pixar, they recognize that, hey, Jeffrey Katzenberg left Disney, had a disagreement with Disney. He now went and formed DreamWorks. DreamWorks is competing directly with Disney. Uh, you know, Jeff, Jeffrey Katzenberg is not playing nice and he's out to win in the space. And so the fact that for Disney, this is a threat means that Pixar might be an appealing option. It you know makes Pixar more important because they have this deal and Pixar can be their way to compete and win against DreamWorks. But the fourth thing, and this is interesting, is, you know, uh, I guess it's it's more about optionality is, um, you know, when they went to uh, renegotiate this deal, Disney didn't have to renegotiate. Pixar also had the option of waiting until this agreement was done. So they could have decided to wait 10 years, which is just crazy, or, or wait until the release of their third film. And, you know, one of the thoughts there was, well... If we're able to have multiple people competing against Disney, we might be able to get better terms. And it's a great thought. And so the fourth thing on, on Pixar's column was, hey, we might actually get a better deal if we wait. Are we sure we want to do this right now? Um, and so the question they were really trying to answer doing this breakdown is, did Pixar have enough to force a negotiation? That's number one. And number two, could it negotiate on favorable terms? Because again, Pixar was doing this to get markedly better terms, like honestly, ideal terms, the terms that they wanted, not that Disney wanted in this deal. Um, and so the final conclusion was that they had enough to find out. And, you know, Steve ends up saying, I think we should go for it. And I think the takeaway here is it's really important to objectively and as clear-eyed as possible, really assess your strength. And I think it's a great way of just make two columns and think about what is a, a strength or a, a added bit of bargaining power for the counterparty? And then what does yours look like? And be really clear right about it. Okay, number four, get clear on what you want and why it's important to you. You have to know what success looks like. And this may make sense. Everything we've been talking about today is, is effectively how you analyze your position and how you decide when to negotiate. Uh, we have one more point around timing in a second. But this is important, which is let's remember that... Um, Okay, if we're successful at, you know, getting Disney to negotiate now and getting them to go on favorable terms, we have to know what the hell we're going to ask for. And we have to have a lot of conviction around it. And so they wanted to make sure before they even reached out that they had a very clear idea of what success looks like. And this may sound obvious. It may sound like common sense. Um, 
it's important. <laughs> I feel like common sense is, if anything, should be reiterated. Common sense points, if anything, should be reiterated more because we should always be operating more from that place. Um, and I think in life, it's actually very easy to operate from common sense. Okay. So, you know, so they're back at the whiteboard. Steve changed the whiteboard pen to a new color. And he wrote now, he does a new breakdown and he says, here's our new deal. Okay, what does our new deal look like? Well, here's what they ended up agreeing on. Number one, they wanted creative control. They wanted to make sure that, because um, and what that meant, just, just uh, as an example, in the initial contract with Disney, Disney had to okay and green all the ideas. So even if Pixar thought and if Pixar's team, if John Lasseter, if their animators thought that this, this next concept for a film was what they wanted to make, they didn't get to make that decision. They had to take it to Disney. And if Disney said no, uh, they literally had a, had a stipulation in the contract that if Disney said no, they could not keep it and work on it on their own. They also had to work on only Disney approved ideas. And, and so effectively, you know, what creative control is really about is they said, hey, we just had an amazing success. We've had an amazing success that John Lasseter led this crazy bold bet to make Toy Story and it worked. Well, we need to now make sure that that John Lasseter and our team internally has full creative control. We can't be beholden to Disney. Gets point number one. The second point, this one's interesting, is they really want it was very important to them because effectively in this initial, the original contract with Disney, there was no uh there's no stipulations around when Disney had to release had to release Pixar's films. Okay, so stepping back here for a second. You know, Pixar makes a film. Disney's responsible for funding the production and then for distributing it. Well, Pixar doesn't get to decide when it goes out, and that's a big issue. And so another issue was that they really wanted to have favorable release windows. Here's why that mattered. It matters a lot when films were released, especially big budget family films. It turns out there's actually only two optimal dates uh, or two optimal windows, which is early summer and then Thanksgiving, which effectively runs through Christmas and the end of the year. And if you look at the release calendar, nothing else comes close during the year. And so obviously if you're Pixar and you put all of this work in and it takes you say four or five years, even, you know, as they get faster, two, three years, it's an enormous amount of work that's basically riding on in part when the film gets released, absolutely non-negotiable. We need to make sure that our films get released in favorable release windows. And so they want to make sure any contract that they entered, they would get favorable release windows. They wanted, you know, so Steve literally said, I want Disney has to treat Pixar films releases like its own. It can't be second class citizens. That's number two. They wanted a 50-50 profit share. Obviously going back to one of the four pillars, it was in there. They basically do all the calculations, do all the financial projections, and uh, there is no way that they can make a workable business without at least getting a 50-50 profit share. That is number three. And the other thing, and, you know, I'll spare this, I'll just you know, say it for a second. But again, the other thing that they wanted to negotiate was how that profit share was calculated. And you can go and do a bit of research here. Um, as I said, I got this book from Hal Vogel all around entertainment analytics, or, sorry, entertainment uh, businesses and how they work. And one of the things you can find out, you can just do a bit of Googling is um, the way that film studios account for profits when they have a profit share are extremely weighted in the film studio's benefit. Because if I'm a film studio, I get paid out first. I get paid out on what's ever left. So I am highly incentivized to put anything and everything that could be considered an expense for that film into the budget to make sure that we're getting, because you know all of those things are going to our company, they're funding part of our operations. And we want to make sure that almost nothing is left over at the end of the day to actually do a profit share. Um, and I'm sure this correlates to recording studios and record labels and, and everything else. Um, but, and so they also wanted to make sure that this revenue share wasn't calculated on ancient Hollywood accounting terms that, that didn't apply, it didn't make sense for a animated uh, film. Okay, it's number three. Number four, Pixar brand. We made the films. The world needs to know that is what Steve said. That was the fourth pillar. Um, and so again, this new deal, they have four things they don't want to budge on. This is what their ideal in-state looks like. They get creative control that's codified in the contract. They get favorable release windows. Disney has to treat Pixar's film as its own. They get a true 50-50 profit share, which is 5X what they initially were getting. 10, they were initially getting 10%. They now want 50-50. And they also want to make sure that, th that they have co-branding and that Pixar's brands associated with all, with all of these. Um, so they go through this work. And Steve finally says, I'll call Eisner. We now know what we want. I'll call him and tell him what we have in mind. You know, so the advice here is just map out what's non-negotiable for you and stick to those items. You have to have conviction in every item on the list. Again, 
you know, uh, Steve Lawrence Levy Pixar didn't have 20 items. They were very, very, very thoughtful about the four things that were important to them. And, you know, I think this also goes back to if there's no positional bargaining and you need to be at a place of conviction and there's no, you know, uh, positional bargaining on uh, end outcome, you need to know what it is. You need to make sure you're not overreaching. You need to make sure you're really clear about what's important to you. And it can't be a long list. And part of that is you need to be able to articulate it to yourself why it's important. And you need to be able to articulate that to the counterparty in a way that they believe that resonates with them that makes sense. Okay. Number five, wait to negotiate until you have maximum leverage. So, you know, part of this, um, part of what made Pixar's renegotiation with Disney successful was one thing, which is they had talked about doing this for a long time. Like literally Lawrence Levy's in the door. And I think this is one or two years before Toy Story even goes out. And he already knows that they have to renegotiate this contract with Disney. So, you know, they, they know that this is a thing. Well, obviously in any negotiation, it's really important to think about when you decide to, to, to reach out and to try and negotiate. And you want to clearly wait until you have maximum leverage. Again, going back to that, you have tactics and you have your positional kind of positional strength. Or, um, yeah, you have your bargaining power. Um, so you have tactics and you have bargaining power. You want to make sure you have as much bargaining power as possible. So this last one is just wait to negotiate until you have maximum leverage. Um, and, and so they waited until the release of Toy Story, hoping and banking on the fact that it was going to be a smash success. And once it was, they knew that they had the halo that they needed to go into negotiation. They also knew that they couldn't wait. And so again, if you think back to that list of um, you know pros and cons for Disney versus Pixar, one of the items on Pixar's was that they could wait. Well, they could wait. But they ended up feeling like they had enough strength with the success of Toy Story that it was just really smart to do it now. And so they didn't even want to wait three months or six months. They wanted to strike while the iron was hot. So this is how they made the decision on timing. If we're going to make a move to renegotiate with Disney, Lawrence suggested, one night in early 1996, we should start seriously thinking about it right away while Toy Story's success is still fresh. And then Steve raises, or maybe better, maybe you know we're better off waiting until we're free to negotiate with other studios and we have more flexibility to pick our best distributing partner. Um, making the move now made sense only if they thought they could negotiate a much stronger, they could negotiate from a strong enough place to justify giving up this optionality in the future. And they ended up doing that. And so again, I think the takeaway is just, you have to make sure that the timing is right. And with that, I, I will conclude this book summary. So this has been um, a quick summary, a breakdown of a really remarkable book to Pixar and beyond my unlikely journey with Steve Jobs to make entertainment history by Lawrence Levy. You can find the show notes for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash Pixar and beyond. Um, and you can also sign up for our newsletter. We release every single episode that we do, obviously as a podcast. You can also subscribe on YouTube, uh, what, whatever way you like to consume content, we have it available. One of those is via a newsletter. And so if you're interested in getting every episode delivered to your inbox for free, go to newsletter.outlieracademy to get it there. And I will be back more with soon. Uh, I would be back more. Uh, I would be back with more soon. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it.